everybody, welcome to another episode of the Brain Food Show. This one is brought to you, well, partially from partially from Washington State, where David is, and partially from my parents' spare room in the UK, which is probably why the audio sounds like a little janky. They, uh, for some reason, they haven't acoustically treated this room. I don't know why they haven't <laughs> made that move. It seems just obvious to me that you would do such a thing. Just consider it when when they have a son who does what you do, you know. You would think so, right? Like thinking? everywhere I go, <laughs> that sh- someone should have a little studio set up. Yeah. What is this? Um, uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. I think by the time this episode goes out, this Christmas will have passed. I hope you had a good one. Probably New Year's coming up. I'm not sure when we have this scheduled for, but we're oh, recording probably. this on Christmas. New Year's, I yeah. bet. Oh, what are we talking about today? Uh, pirates. Pirate <laughs> things. I always like a good pirate adventure. Yeah, yeah, probably. We did Julius Caesar. Didn't we do a pirate episode with Julius Caesar? We did, and this one is actually going to be on the, I mean, arguably the most famous pirate of all time, or most successful pirate of all time, who happens, mm. just so happens to have been a woman, actually. Wow, there you go. Yeah. Like, gender equality, equality and piracy. She, she was uh, yeah. breaking barriers. Back in the day. So I think, are we doing it like... I, it's all very weird. I'm very disorientated because I'm sitting at an exercise bench with this little Zoom H1 <laughs> recorder and my laptop rather than my usually blown up on a big screen and with my like nice gear and stuff. But I've got to remember, this is a regular episode. Are we starting this with a quick fact, then doing a main section, then doing some follow up? Yep, we are. And the quick fact to begin is going to be on the origin of Grog and like how, how did that name come about and whatnot. So, um... uh-huh. To begin with, uh, we look, uh, so freshwater aboard ships obviously didn't stay too fresh very long and it would get mm. like slimy and lots of bacteria and algae or algae uh, growing in it. And so this, it became uh, kind of common to mix beer and wine rations. So they would give them quite a bit of beer and wine. I, I, like in some, it was like a gallon of beer or wine to mix with the water or just drink. Uh, as Every day? Yeah, every day per sailor. And so this is a problem, as you might imagine, on a long voyage to have that much of that for people to drink, uh, to just, you know, improve the taste of water and whatnot. And so to get around this problem, they switched uh, eventually around the 17th and 18th centuries to rum became very popular. And so it's a lot stronger than beer or wine, obviously. So you need much less of it to mix with the water to make it good. Um, (laughs) So this is the... It became a thing to actually do. It was about a half pint per per sailor per day of rum, and they would just uh, they would just mix it in. And this actually became official in Britain uh, in 1731 when, in the regulations and instructions relating to His Majesty's service at sea, this just became the standard rum ration that they would get, and they would mix it with water. And this this eventually became called grog. And so, mm-hmm. so how did this, how did this actually become like why grog? How did this come to be? So it turns out, um, of course, because it is so much stronger, rum is so much stronger. A lot of the sailors would save up their rum rations and then just drink the rum straight, you know, rather than mixing it <laughs> how, with water. How did they never see this one coming? <laughs> yeah. And so then they'd get really drunk and this caused a lot of problems aboard the, the ships, obviously. And so this brings us to British Vice Admiral Edward Vernon. And so he yeah. began requiring in, in all the ships under him, his command, you had to actually mix the rum with the water before you gave it to the sailors mm, so that they mm, couldn't ration it. guy. <laughs> yeah. And so that they wouldn't, you wouldn't get drunk on it. And so, uh, yeah, he ar- originally ordered this on August 21st, 1740. And it was uh, the precise mixture he said about was two quarts of water with one pint of rum so that was the the ratio and he also he, he actually interesting would also put uh have him put lime juice in it as well and mm-hmm. this was before this was actually about seven years before it was definitively known what you know how to prevent scurvy well you know using like citrus fruits and stuff yeah. um, but he uh, but that that got discovered about seven years later by james lynn but before this uh the vice admiral edward vernon was requiring that it be mixed as well in this grog and do we so, know why I don't know. Maybe he had just had a feeling about it, or yeah, or maybe it just improved. He just thought it tasted better. I don't know. Uh, Either way, uh, either way. So this, and then this eventually became kind of standard throughout the the British Navy. And actually, it's funny because this that's 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 the that that's the Royal Navy. Yeah. Yeah. What's funny about this, though, is grog actually was a standard ration all the way up till July thirty first, nineteen seventy. 1970 in the wow. royal navy yeah can you drink in the navy and stuff like if you're on a big ship can you do yeah. they have like because i watch tv shows and it's like you know they'll be on this this ship and they'll like be cracking out some beers and stuff like on a special yeah. occasion but do they like have a pub on a big ship or whatever where they go like when they're off duty like in star trek or not i don't i don't know 
I don't know. But I do know that it was this this rum mixture was something they were given as a ration, part of their rations. But they did over time that it was uh, the rum uh, portion of it was gradually reduced uh, from the original. Yeah. And then actually starting in 1850 as well, the officers were no longer allowed to. Oh, sorry. 1881, the officers were no longer allowed to to drink it. So, um, Uh. yeah. Yeah, that, but, but now back to the name Grog, like how, what, what did this have to do with Vice Admiral Vernon and how did it get the name? So it turns out the Admiral's nickname was Old Grog because he wore a grogram cloak that was that's oh. just like this like a uh, wool silk mohair like cloak that has that's been waterproofed basically and so this okay. is the thing he wore and he was nicknamed old grog and i think uh, presumably because he was the one who kind of set out this mixture and the standard and stuff uh that that kind of got adopted over and then just the mixture became known as grog there yeah. you go Oh, wait, I, if more. I was in the Navy and I was like enjoying my like rum every day until like 1970 and yeah. then they were like, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> it would be like, there'd be like another West Point riot. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. where's our croc? Yeah, presumably. But there's actually one more thing. Uh, Admiral Vernon, uh, Admiral Vernon, who got named after him was Mount Vernon, the President George Washington's estate. That is how We've that... talked about this recently and I watched National Treasure 2. Yeah. Is this the yeah. same thing? Yeah, Mount yeah. Vernon. Oh. Yeah, so this was named after Admiral Vernon. And it turns out George Washington's half brother, Lor- uh, Lawrence Washington, he served yeah. under Admiral Vernon. And when he inherited their father's Augustine Washington's estate, uh, it was actually called Little Hunting Creek at that point. But he changed the name to Mount Vernon. And then when George Washington inherited it, uh, he just kept the name Mount Vernon rather than switching it back to Little Hunting Creek or changing it. And so that is why Mount Vernon is named Mount Vernon. It feels a little more catchy, like Mount Ver- Mount Vernon over like Little Hunting Creek. It does. That's it a sounds very descriptive name. <laughs> yeah, well, and it sounds a little more uh, like high class, presidential. Like, yeah, yeah, like Mount Vernon, whereas Little Hunting Creek, you know, <laughs> not good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the president's retreat at Little Hunting Creek. Yeah, yeah. Where do they go today? What's the name of that like ranch in the middle of nowhere? Um, um, they always go Camp to the movies. Camp David. That Camp David. This sounds yeah. cool. Like yeah. Camp David. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Is that it? Is that the is that, that that's quick, the quick It wasn't fact. such a quick fact today. I was reasonably quick, like five minutes. Quick. Six minutes. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Wix. Wix allows you to create a website for your personal brand, your business, your wedding. Maybe you got a podcast. You can also use Wix to make a website for a podcast like we did at brainfood.fm. You can check that out. All made with Wix. Uh, they, they, what happens here was Wix knew about our YouTube channel. They knew we were doing this brain food podcast. We got a website for the YouTube channel already, but we didn't have one for the, for the podcast. And they were like, Hey, why don't you use our website builder? You can put it together. It'll be a nice little collaboration. Anyway, on the homepage of this website, I added the Wix podcast tool. And this is just one thing. You kind of just go into their app store you, and they've got loads of different apps, different things. Like, like I said, if you're running a shop, you can add like uh, sales functionality or all, all of this sort of stuff. Or like, if you're a photographer, you can put like a gallery in there. I'm a podcaster. We make a podcast. So we click on the podcast tool, we drop it in. And then all of the titles, all of the episodes, a little description, there's a player, you can click play and listen to it on the website and all of that stuff. Or go and subscribe and all of these things just ultra easy just by pasting in a link to our podcast uh, feed. It was it was incredibly easy. Wix websites, they also look great on a mobile. So this website, it looks pretty. When I was making it, I was looking, you know, I was using Chrome or whatever. I'm browsing through and it looks amazing. And then I didn't even look at it on a website. And then I was like, oh, okay, I don't know. This this sounds pretty good. I didn't know that it would automatically look good on a mobile. I loaded up on my mobile phone and it looks amazing. You can even click the play thing and listen on there. It's uh, all of that functionality just works. You can check out our site at brainfood.fm. Wix also offers unlimited pages and top grade hosting for free. Don't have to pay for it, but you can upgrade to one of their premium plans for as little as five dollars a month if you want to get even more. All you need to do is go to wix.com forward slash go forward slash brainfood to get started. I mean, why not? Just uh, again, that is wix.com forward slash go forward slash brain food. It's free. If you want some premium stuff, you pay a little bit more and it's great. Just uh, yeah, definitely check out Wix and let's get back to the show. So what are we actually talking about? Is it piracy, right? This, piracy. There wasn't any piracy in the quick fact. I'm looking forward to some no. piracy. I mean, it had to do with grog, you know, and rum. So it's kind of pirate-esque. True. But, yeah. But, but so this, there's uh, so... It, it turns out female pirates weren't actually 
completely unheard of in the coast of Asia in the 18th and 19th centuries. And there, but there was one woman, one woman who became, she rose uh, from quite humble beginnings to becoming one of the, arguably actually the, the most successful pirate in the history of pirates, like in the history yeah. of, uh, of, of all this, pirates, men of all pirates, women. doesn't any, and, and anywhere. So her birth name was Shi Yang Gu, but uh, she would go by a ton of different names throughout her lifetime. But we're going to yeah. go with... <laughs> FYI, this episode pronunciation wise is going to be a mess. <laughs> we're we're going to go with Ching Shi as the one we're going to just call her for the rest of the yeah. time, even though throughout different periods she went by different names based on, you know, who she was married to at times or what she was doing. So uh, in any event, so she was born sometime around 1775. It's not really clear uh, when exactly and not really much is known about her childhood at all. And so we're just going to fast forward right into where her life gets interesting at the age of around, she was around 26 ish. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was working as a prostitute in a floating brothel in Canton, which floating brothel sounds like something from a movie. Like if you were setting a movie about pirates, you'll be like yeah. scene one, the floating brothel. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, it turns out uh, this obviously a floating brothel was was frequented by sailors and pirates and things. And at some point she caught the eye of one Zheng Yi and he was a quite successful pirate, uh, the leader of the Red Flag Fleet, which had a couple hundred ships at this point. Like, And when I say ships, I mean like mostly small boats, like tiny boats and then like some <laughs> some big ships, you know, yeah. uh, so. Uh, so exactly how the two got together is kind of disputed. It's sort of, uh, if you read some accounts, uh, historical accounts, they claim that Jing Yi actually, they raided the, the, the floating brothel and took all the prostitutes and then he wanted for his, for himself Ching Shi. Uh, but uh, whether that's how it happened or whether he just liked her and went and proposed and they got married, uh, which seems like maybe like the better one because when they got married, he actually granted her quite a bit in the in the marriage, like as far as like control over his fleet, like a share in things. Okay. And so it seems like if he's just like going and you know randomly stealing her, like why would he give her you know anything necessarily? Those are also two very disparate things. Yeah. It's kind of like, well, he either proposed to her and they got married, or he raided their brothel, stole her, and essentially yeah. she became his sex slave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it turns out that when they did get married, they, they actually ran the Red Flag Fleet together quite quite jointly um, and successfully. And so up with it, so this brings us so from about 1801 to 1807, this is a six-year span, they go from that initial around 200 boats of various sizes to around 600, and then to peak to about seven, 1,700 total boats uh, by 1807. And there was about... That's a lot of boats. That's a lot of boats. And I mean, only a few hundred of them were like larger vessels and stuff, but they were still, that's that's a lot of people under his command, under both of theirs command, actually. Um, and it turns out this is where uh, November 16th, 1807, Jing Yi, he finds himself either... Either he was killed in a typhoon or he died in the Thai Son Rebellion in Vietnam. It's not really clear which way. Either way. I love it's just like this. It's not like this, any of this history sort of close to each other. It's just yeah. two wildly different options. But either way, it is known November 16th, 1807, he died somehow. And so. <laughs> okay. This then this is where uh, rather than you know she could have stepped aside here Ching she could have but instead she convinces the second in command who's a 21 year old named Chang Pao who just so happens to be her adopted son because uh, he basically when he was 15 Chang Pao he got captured and you know he was basically you can be a pirate or we'll kill you or sell you into slavery or whatever this is kind of how pirate. it went choose pirate <laughs> yeah definitely he chose pirate and he was the son of a fisherman so he knew his way around boats and he very quickly rose the ranks and uh, soon enough Zheng Ji Zheng Yi and Qing Shi decided to adopt him as their son, like officially, legally, they adopted him uh, legally as their son, uh, okay. which became a problem for her later when she goes to marry him. <laughs> so she had, to oh get my. That, she had to get that annulled. Um, She's like the original Woody Allen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but either way, so he's the second commander. It is Woody Allen who married his stepdaughter. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, or something <laughs> like. Was something I didn't want to accidentally bespurge someone. It's like, or was no, it like an adopted? Allen. Yeah, yeah, some sort of adopted kid or something. I don't. Know. I remember it being a bit weird. Yeah, I don't actually remember the details, but yes, something like that. So, so either way, so she goes to Cheng Pao, and she's basically wants to make an alliance with him. 
uh, to he'll support her to kind of take over the fleet and she'll support him with all her connections and everything uh, to basically so he'll run kind of the kind of the official operations like when they're actually out raiding and stuff but she's kind of running all the business side of things mm-hmm. and kind of organizing things and military strategy and stuff like that like the high level stuff and he's kind of just the one who implements it uh, you know with the men kind of thing and mm. so th- this is kind of the thing and and quite quickly the pair of them consolidate their power and they also use some connections to get quite a lot of uh, of weapons and things from the British um, which was yeah. Which was to really fortify and stock their ships with lots of uh, weapons and things. And this is where the the Red Flag fleet at this point, uh, at their peak, 1810, they had re- they now had about 1,800 vessels of various sizes. They had about 50 to 80 thousand people under their command. This is a full on navy. Yeah, it is. And this is why she was so successful. And about uh, about 17 thousand of the people under command were actually like pirates under her control. Like like they're actually on the ships. And the rest were things like you know she had farmers, she had like spies, children, like people you know on the mainland and stuff, kind of working for her in various ways um, yeah and she ended up uh, controlling this basic... is not just a navy then she's like running an empire yeah a little it's a little empire she's the the guangdong province she controlled almost the entire thing uh there she had go. a nice vast spy network within the Qing dynasty and <laughs> and basically was just dominating the south chinese sea and and not just not just like looting and stealing stuff from like ships and stuff. So they would go. She set up ad hoc government. She had like in local towns around ports and stuff. She controlled them completely. And like when she would go against some of them, she would you know if they resisted, then she would. I mean, she was absolutely brutal. She would have them, like all the men would be beheaded and all the women and children would be taken to use you know slaves or you know wives or whatever. And then this is what to do. But if they didn't resist, if they just paid tribute, then it was fine. Nothing would happen, and you just keep like a tax. And so she just established laws and taxes in the region she controlled and yeah. uh, any of her pirates who did anything in these towns like or these or any ship that paid you know any merchants that wanted to pay the tax basically to travel in her seas uh, if they paid like any pirate who did anything against these would be beheaded uh, so it was it was a quite safe you know it was just like a little I love, I always called tribute yeah. it's like no, that's extortion. That's just like whatever. It's like you've got to pay your protection money. Yeah. It's yeah. like that's not protection money. You're pre- <laughs> that's well, extortion. If it's kind of reasonable, it almost is just like a government in taxes, right? Like if she's not being well, completely except you're not the government. <laughs> it's just as, it's not like it, well, yeah, we're providing you healthcare. No, yeah. no, you're just well, not pillaging us. Safety, you know, like a government might provide police and military and stuff, and she's kind of yeah, but it's not same. like if. But it's not like if you don't pay them, they're going to come to your house and beat you up. (laughs) Well, I mean, in the olden days, maybe. (laughs) Actually, that's probably right. (laughs) Or they'll put you in prison where you will subsequently get beaten up. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, So, so yeah, she she had basically like a little ad hoc government taxation system laws. And some of these laws are pretty, I mean, they were, they were brutal. And so she had, you know, direct, you know, people did what she wanted. Uh, So if you want to read, you know, just some of the specific laws, just, you know. Yeah, sure. Uh, If you disobey an order, you get your head chopped off and your body thrown in the ocean. If you steal anything from uh, from the common plunder before it has been divided up, you get your head chopped off and your body thrown in the... Oh, I'm sensing a trend here. And your body thrown in the ocean. If you rape anyone without permission from the leader of your squadron... You get your head chopped off and your body thrown in the ocean. If you have consensual sex with anyone while on duty, you get your head chopped off and your body thrown in the ocean. And women involved would get something heavy strapped to their head, uh, strapped to her, and also tossed in the ocean. If you loot a town or a ship or anything or uh, at all or other, blah. If you loot a town or ship of anything at all or otherwise harass them when they have paid tribute, you get your head chopped off and your body thrown in the ocean. If you take shore leave without permission. You get your head chopped off and your body thrown in the ocean. Mixing it up, though, if you try to leave the organization, you get your ears chopped off and you... No, actually, you just get your ears chopped off. And then you're allowed to leave. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) No. Captured ugly women were allowed... were to set free... were to be set free unharmed. Captured pretty women could be divvied up or purchased by members of the Red Flag Fleet. However, if a pirate was awarded or purchased a pretty woman, he was then considered married to her, and he was expected to treat her accordingly. Yeah, and she Maybe was then is like she was then actually a part of the pirate group, and she with full rights and everything as any other member of the pirate group. Uh, so it was, she was, you know, I mean, wow. she it wasn't really her choice to get married or whatever, but you know, once once on the inn, she was treated nicely, I guess. 
Maybe, you know, like earlier we were mentioning, there's like two opposites of like he either kidnapped her or he proposed to her. Maybe yeah. this is why it's a bit blurry, because that seems a bit blurry. Maybe this is kind of yeah. how it was back in the day. Yeah. Anyway. And, and, and if he didn't treat yeah. the, the woman well, he got his head chopped <laughs> off chopped his, off body, and his thrown body thrown in the ocean. In the ocean. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to have it. <laughs> yeah. so this is... Every crime is punishable by the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they did have, like, some other stuff where you'd get whipped and stuff, the first offense, and then, you know, the second offense, maybe you get your head chopped off. Head chopped off and your body thrown in the face. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was strict, but it worked. I mean, the, I mean, you're, you're controlling this vast of an organization. Uh, you gotta, you know, be, be quite strict there. So, so yeah, as, as I said, she also, you know, raided Although, towns. hang on, hang on. Yeah. I gotta take issue with what you just said. Yeah. If you're controlling an organization as vast as this, I'm fairly sure a lot of modern navies are bigger than this, and there's not a lot of head chopping off and bodies being thrown in the ocean. Well, but they have the modern navies have the governments backing them, so you know, like there's things there. This is she's, a fairly big force. She's like she's like got the governments against her, which we'll get into shortly. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well managed. It seemed you know, seemed to work out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Obey me, or yeah. there are consequences. <laughs> Yeah, so as you might imagine from, from her controlling a lot of not just the sea, but also towns and stuff along coastal mm. towns and along rivers and stuff, uh, you know, the, the, the government, the emperor and whatnot did not take kindly to this. So they raised a fleet of ships to attack her fleet. But unfortunately, she was also apparently quite a brilliant military strategist, as was her, her stepson, future husband. Um, and so they, so they pretty much uh, destroyed the Emperor's Armada pretty easily, and in the process were able to capture all, uh, quite a lot of ships, including 63 of the large ships sent against her, and this and the surviving crews of all this. So this was, she not only with this battle uh, won, but, and, and just kind of decimated the Emperor's Armada. But on top of that, she actually made her forces much stronger because she gave the troops on the other side the, the, the option. You could either get nailed to the deck and be beaten to death, uh, or or you could just join the fleet and we could have a party and celebrate our victory. Um, join so, the fleet. Yeah, they pretty <laughs> much all joined the fleet. <laughs> joined the fleet. And so she gained quite a lot of large vessels and uh, small vessels as well, and, uh, and, and a lot of uh, very experienced uh, crew uh, to add to her fleet. And so this, this, this got the, the Qing dynasty was like, okay, so now we're going to, they basically paid the British, the Portuguese, and the Dutch to come against her armada, uh, okay. kind of combined. And this, yeah. this, you have to get three giant navies together. <laughs> yeah, so these huge ones. To then, and then they they did they just wage war against Ching Shi's organization for two years with little success at first. What? Um, yeah, two straight years of battling and not really much headway. And then finally, with this going on, the emperor was finally like, okay, what if we just offered your entire organization amnesty for all crimes? Uh, hey, what, what, what about that? And she, at first, she re she rejects this. But then uh, the Portuguese actually in 1810, actually, there was a series of battles that actually the Portuguese were winning. Uh, and then finally she decided, yes, so the Portuguese had kind of captured part of her fleet, a large portion, including Cheng Pao, um, who actually, yeah. the, interesting, the Portuguese uh, the admiral who was in charge, like he at the end of, of one of the, I can't remember the name of the battle, he actually, when he had captured him, he, rather than, you know, do anything bad to him, he actually went aboard his ship. Uh, just to just to like meet him and because they were he had like great respect for Cheng Pao and his strategy and like they'd been yeah. battling and they and they actually later uh, the Portuguese didn't take any with with these victories they could have taken a lot of these ships for their own and stuff they chose not to because they're just out of respect for the for the, the this organization and whatnot so it was kind of interesting um, so so finally she was with this defeat she goes ahead and decides to work out a peace treaty and they showed the the, the deal that was basically the fleet would disband completely uh yeah. and every all, well almost all of her many thousands of people under her would get complete amnesty except for 376 of them uh, uh 126 of them were executed and 250 were arrested for other crimes uh, but the rest all the rest many thousands Wait, wasn't got, this like tens of thousands of people yeah it was all the rest got off scot-free and not only scot-free <laughs> but they were allowed to keep any loot they had gotten in the interim they were also uh they also they, they gave him money for her to distribute as she saw fit to kind of help people transition to their lives and any any member of her crew that wanted to join the the uh, navy could do so including yeah. her her stepson or adopted slash son husband. i should say <laughs> yeah slash now husband uh, she oh. as part of the deal she got negotiated to annul the fact that he was her adopted son and now they could marry and so they did get married uh, and then he actually became an admiral 
uh, and given command of 20 ships in the Qing wow. Dynasty Navy. Navy, And so, and then she she got to keep all her stuff. And not only her, her Chang Pao and her both got uh, noble titles. Hers was the lady by imperial decree. So she became a member of the aristocracy, <laughs> so that which gave her a lot of protections. And she got to keep all her money and everything that she had. So she retires. She's now 35 years old-ish, uh, give or take, depending on when exactly. Wait, didn't she take. start doing this at like 26? Yeah, yeah. This was quite a, quite a run That's for a her. solid decade. Yeah. And so she's just she's around 35 and she retires uh, quite wealthy and now a member of the aristocracy and she, she for a while she just with Cheng Pao he was an admiral she with him but then he dies and so then uh, he dies I think it was nine years later but in the interim of that she opened a gambling house slash brothel in Canton which she ran until her uh, death at the age of 69 she also became a, a mother and grandmother and everything uh, and also was a military advisor for during the first opium war um, just a strategy you know there you go kind of interesting yeah. and so just uh, can you imagine like uh, she's like a mother and grandmother at this point like the stories she's telling her like great you know you've got your kids and you're telling them bedtime stories like pretty this. solid yeah 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 but, i mean yeah. we're telling her story what yeah. 200 years later yeah exactly amazing and uh, so yeah so pretty much i mean i can't think of any other pirate in history that even comes close to that and to get away with it all like not be executed or punished in any way actually gets yeah. kind of made into nobility because of it i feel i feel like there's an important life lesson here like yeah. in the ridiculous you know like yeah. in terms of like like i always think of like the will smith one when he was in all that debt and it's yeah. like hey important life lesson if you're in a massive amount of debt just make yeah. loads more money yeah, exactly. <laughs> this life lesson is if you're gonna be a criminal be such a horrific terrible criminal yeah. that they have to negotiate with you <laughs> yeah just the, you're just so amazing that you end up just you know they're just so impressed that they're going to you know make you uh, you know rich yes. and wealthy <laughs> It was like bad life lessons from today. I can't tell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, yeah. So that is that is her story. Um, she's actually, I think it was the was the Pirates of the Caribbean three or something. They had a character that sort of was kind of named or sort of loosely based off her. I can't remember. I don't think I've ever seen any of the pirates. That, I think I might have seen like half of one on a flight once. It was yeah. bad. It was the, it was real bad. No, yeah, the first one was entertaining i thought but it was also didn't make any sense in many parts like like at the beginning when they're supposed to be all skeletons and like in the moonlight or whatever but then like for like the entire opening battle they're not skeletons it's only skeletons <laughs> after the big reveal and so it's like well but what about like two minutes ago you know, no so, one notices uh, that you weren't skeletons <laughs> yeah uh, and they never show it that way but either way either way. i thought the first one was entertaining and the rest were not good at all um, but, well they're like 19 of these now yeah, it, it seems like every year there's a new one, and and they yeah. do have like a budget of like a couple of hundred million dollars. So yeah, well, because they're kind of is it a Disney property? They must be making money. Yeah, they, I think they're kind of those entertaining ride. Plus, there's probably lots of merchandise and stuff with those as well. Yeah, um, it's like the Fast and the Furious. I feel like yeah, every couple of years there's a huge Fast and the Furious movie. I hadn't seen any of them. Then a friend of mine is very much into it. Yeah. And he was like, dude, we got to go see Fast and the Furious. And I'm like, all right, man, we'll go see Fast and the Furious. <laughs> I, it was, I, I left. I walked out of the cinema. It was terrible. Yeah. Yeah, it was I watched, truly I, awful. I've seen the first one when I was like a teenager or something. I mean, it was awful then, but you know, yeah. no. <laughs> I've not seen <laughs> the subsequent don't, ones. Don't go see any of them. Isn't it, like the seventh one, one of the most... Uh, highest grossing films of all time or something like that? I believe that. it is. That's the one I saw. Uh, um, yeah. I, that, I, I hadn't walked out of the cinema in a long time. And I was like, there were like five of us who went, so it wasn't like I was just leaving my friend alone in the cinema. But I was <laughs> like, boys, this is, this is truly bad. <laughs> and I like bad action movies. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm making my way through Nicolas Cage's filmography, so I'm not exactly, you know, super discerning. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but this was terrible. <laughs> $1.5 billion Furious 7 made. How does that rank it? Like, where's uh, it's Avatar? Number, it's number seven. I don't uh, know if this oh, is... A, I don't think this is adjusted for inflation or anything, so it's just the gross, the, the total gross. Um, Avatar is number one, Titanic, then Star Wars Force Awakens, then Avengers Infinity War, Jurassic World. Really? Jurassic World? Jurassic World? The Avengers Furious 7. And I thought another. Jurassic World was good, but it doesn't belong up there. No. And it wasn't that good. No. It was entertaining. And then they had the stupid modified dinosaur, which was a bit of a dumb plot that I thought 
it was i don't know yeah. i liked i think it was more just like i love the original jurassic park so much that it was just nice to see some more jurassic park disney and i like that chris dude what's his name chris pine yeah Is that chris, uh, chris pine? Fr- chris pratt pratt yeah. is chris pine pine the guy in star trek the the yeah something who plays like that. spark something i don't know <laughs> anyway disney absolutely owns this like top 20 list of movies oh, yeah. yeah completely well, d- just for some comparison what did avatar do avatar was 2.7 billion almost 2.8 which is in 2009 too so i mean you know adjust that up it's to like the fat furious 7 that would probably be closer to 3 billion <laughs> did you just call it the fat furious 7? <laughs> That's a very different movie. Seven <laughs> overweight people compete. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Mar- it was basically Marvel, which also Disney, you know, and, and Disney kind of own these these top ones. Yeah. Is this where our pirate journey ends today? Uh, no. It seems quite. Oh, no. Okay. We have. Pirate I was like, <laughs> she was running the thing. She dies. She tells her grandchildren's story. I was like, this is wrapped up. But no. oh no, yeah, that wraps up her story. But we have more. Oh. We have bonus facts. Oh. Oh, yeah. Tell me so, some bonus facts. All right, so we're gonna start out with some because I know how everyone loves etymologies. Uh, <laughs> this is the one. Like, I, I find like etymologies. It's interesting. It's often fun to see where the words come from. Yeah. People love these, like on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I was like, surely this is something that just Simon finds interesting. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> yeah. So pirate terms. We're gonna start with this. I've asked. So this, this for people who don't know, it actually mm. actually means stop or hold still. So that's what they're they're saying when they say like "I've asked me mates" or whatever. Uh, so okay. this this actually comes from the uh, Dutch phrase "oidvast," which literally just means hold fast. And then this got slurred down to "oidvast," and then "avast." And then it was around the 17th century when this just became kind of a ubiquitous term among sea folk, uh, which was I don't okay. know, that's that one. It also and makes it, sense, like the. Uh, do you know that antivirus program of Ask Antivirus? Oh yeah, I think it's like oh, yeah. one of the big ones that would make sense. Never really thought about that. Wasn't yeah, that was like a free one for a while, wasn't it? Um, was it or was that AVG? Oh yeah, I think that was AVG. Because I had AVG for a while, but I definitely yeah. know Avast is one as well. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And this one, I just think is funny. This next one is a coxswain. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because <Which> apparently. <laughs> So it's a boy servant, a swain, in charge of a small cock. <laughs> I think we need to explain what cock means in this context. A cock was a small boat used to transport people from ship to shore. And this, oh. uh, going all the way back to the 15th century is where this cock swain uh, term came. And I think it's still a term used today, but I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, and then continuing to uh, appeal cock to... Cock swain the, is definitely a thing. Isn't that yeah, like yeah. when you have rowing? Yeah. It's the small oh, yeah, person yeah, who sits yeah. in the front of the boat. Yeah, yeah. And so continuing on the, the teenage boy humor, um, Scuttlebutt is a, a oh. ca- cask of drinking water aboard the ship, and the butt being the wooden cask and the scuttle being the act of drilling a hole in the butt. <laughs> um, and so, and when they would, you know, how the term gossip or rumors came about is, of course, when you're just, you know, like anything around the water cooler in the workplace or whatever. So around the scuttlebutt, you know, you're just... So talking. this is like literally the 18th century equivalent of yeah. the water well, cooler. <laughs> yeah. And so that's how their gossip rumors kind of definition of scuttlebutt. And then uh, once again, continuing on to bunghole. So a cat, oh. <laughs> it was the cat. Well, the cast was, of course, called the butt. And then it, a hole in the butt, it, 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 <laughs> which you would stop her with a bung. So then the, the, the hole was just called a bung hole. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes <Okay. laughs> so, the unfortunate pirate words yeah and so another one duffel so you got that you know that rough wooden cloth kind of duffel bag type thing oh, that, yeah. okay yeah. yeah so that that actually comes from the the name of the flemish town duffel and so this just just uh got applied to the personal effects that people would carry along just this in this way the duffel that's what it was called um from yeah, this kind of go. rough wooden cloth that they would make there and so now we have like the the like the actual like the yarmi mateys or our you know? yeah exactly so this this the, act- I, I like how you've described it in the notes the classic vociferation of a pirate <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so this is that how you pronounce vociferation yeah, yeah that's definitely one i'd look up when making a video <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> it was it was uh, in at least in Hollywood depictions and whatnot. It's a, is a staple of pirate speak, but it turns out that this does not actually appear to be historically based at all, um, and was popularized in the 1950s version of Treasure Island, uh, which was uh, just kind of that that movie and the Robert Newton who played Long John Silver sort of set the standard for what how we you know mm. view a pirate like how they should dress, how they should talk, the accent, everything. Robert Newton kind of. Kind of set the standard here, uh, whether it was historically based or not. But he, it turns out, was from England's West Country. Which, yeah. Because um, if you go to the West Country, you do yeah. think everyone speaks like a pirate. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so this, he adopted this because Long John Silver was the fictional character, was actually <laughs> supposed to be from this very region. And so he adopted kind of this, the, you know, the various sayings and the, their accent and everything for this character. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just went ahead and went with that, and it turns out that that this like our thing was something that was said in the West Country uh, around the time when oh. he was he was a child and whatnot. But it was it was just meant kind of like okay, you know, like it just that was just a thing people said. Uh, but it doesn't. This wasn't. Do you want some coffee? Arr. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, the, but it doesn't appear that this was a thing like anywhere else at all and and going back to more like the golden age of the, of like piracy and whatnot it doesn't there's no record of this being a thing back then um and it just seems to be something that he adopted for the character and then it just kind of stuck around um so um, so yeah it is theoretically possible that there were some you know west country uh, pirate at some point who did say this but there's really no reference of it anywhere and uh, who knows if they actually said this back then or if it was just something like early 20th century or late 19th century or something but either way Robert Newton he played the character of Long Nut Silver in the film and TV sequels and this this just kind of this is how everyone you know thinks pirates talk now yeah so <laughs> it's kind of like like everyone now thinks that's how pirates speak yeah, just or, one and, actor and dress and everything, and you have like the peg legs and stuff too. That's like a common pirate thing that wasn't actually a thing. Because can you imagine a pirate actually having a peg leg it's and trying to be? It's not. You're not going to be a very good pirate um, if you're on board a ship trying to stay standing. And of course, uh, you just amputations in general weren't exactly high success rates of survival <laughs> back then. So it wasn't like pirates. There was many going around. Um, also, pir- that, that eye patch has got to be like something else as well, because like your depth yeah. perception as a pirate and a sailor has got to be pretty essential. Yeah, that one supposedly had to do with I don't know if it's actually known if that was actually a thing or but there's supposedly people uh, justified that maybe they were trying to keep one eye adjusted to be able to go below deck and still be able to see instantly and then come back out. Is oh. sort of the thought, but I don't actually remember if that was actually a thing or if that's just something people say. Uh, but another thing like pirates, uh, the pirate thing with like the reputation, oh, they're going to pirate or capture and kill and loot and everything like that. And it turns out it was more like Ching Shi, where it's like if you didn't resist, you were fine. You just have to pay tribute or whatever, and then they'll leave you alone because they didn't want the pirates didn't want to go like killing and, you know, raping and pillaging and all the time. Because if you did this, if the people knew they were going to come and like kill people, you would fight. Right. Like that's what yeah. you would do. You'd but fight it, to the death. Absolutely. But if you just think, oh, they're going to come and we'll just give them some money and they'll go away. Like, then you just be like, OK, whatever. Here you go. Um, unless you thought you were, you know, had superior force or whatever. But this so this was kind of the thing. Pirates weren't exactly it. Most of the time didn't come to to capture or whatever they are. They were just, you know, they just wanted some money and then they would go away. Kind of, you know, well, I also like the ones who were like that, if there were any, they're not going to last very long. <laughs> no, no, because yeah, you're having to fight every time you capture anything that's going to you're going to lose a lot of people in the in the interim so uh, hmm. but either way moving on from terms now uh, well not quite but moving on from pirate terms i should say to just more generic port and starboard um so how did why do we i mean obviously they said this because you know you could get turned around on a ship if you're saying right left you know whatever um so you want to make it unequivocally clear what you're referring to which side of the ship um so uh starboard it turns out was just uh, so back in the day but they didn't have a century it wasn't common to have the centrally placed rudder. You'd just have like a steering oar on one side of the ship. And just okay. because just because uh, most people are right-handed, it just would be on the right side. Um, especially these small boats, it was just, you know, you'd just hold it with your right hand. And some of the bigger boats, as they got bigger, they would start to do where you'd hold it um, with both hands, which came uh, gave us another term, which we'll get into shortly. But uh, so starboard, that is literally just the, the, the side... That just means the steering oar, the, the side of the ship the steering oar is on, which was the starboard. Um, so that's how that term came around from the Anglo-Saxon starboard, which just meant side steering oar. 
Um, so that was really non-confusing because right now, like nowadays, you say starboard or port, and most people, it's like you just kind of have to know which side of the ship that is. You have to memorize that at some point. Whereas back yeah. then, it was just completely obvious. You're like starboard. What's well, the side of the ship that has the steering oar? Um, do you know how? Do you know how to remember it? There's a saying. Okay. What like is? I used to I used to go sailing, and it, you say there's a little red port left in the bottle. Because port is left, and also okay. it's red, and starboard is green. So, oh, like yeah. when at night and your boat's illuminated, the yeah. port or, side is. Or airplanes yeah. as well. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Didn't know that. Do they use port and starboard on planes? Uh, I don't think so, but you or do have that, that light. That light. So when you're that way, when you're like if you're flying at night and you see a ship, uh, a plane off in the distance, you can't necessarily tell which way they're going. Like, are they approaching you? Are they heading uh-huh. towards you or away from you? And you can tell then by the, the different colors. <laughs> Something quite handy to know. <laughs> yeah, it is, especially when you're going really fast and they're going really fast and, you know. Um, <laughs> As planes I want to do. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's where starboard, uh, just quite easily to know. There's just the side of the ship that had the starboard on it. Um, mm-hmm. So that gave the, then before port, there was actually the old English backboard, which was just this, so on large boats, like I was saying, you would hold it with two hands to kind of steer. You would need both hands to do it. Um, and so this just like, it's thought that this came from, you know, your backs facing the other side. Um, so that is where that term came from. And that eventually came, uh, eventually a different term came up. It was called ladderboard, uh, which was just basically, so you, so at the port, you would load on one side, which wouldn't be the side that the steering oar was on because that would get in the way of the dock and everything and, you know, my uh-huh. damage if the ship is, you know, hitting. So you would have the ladder board or just the laden mean to load board. So the ship side that's on the dock, basically. And so that became the common term after backboard. And then uh, this got slurred down to larboard uh, in the 16th century. But this created a bit of a problem because you have larboard, larboard and starboard which if you're shouting stuff in like a storm or a battle or something that kind of rhyme. And so it's not necessarily good that they sound so yeah. similar. And so around this time, they started, people just started saying port as well. It was another thing that they said. And this kind of gradually port over time because of this sort of potential for confusion, uh, you know, usurped larboard. And then by the 19th century, mid 19th century, it actually became official in the Royal Navy um, and the U.S. Navy as well. 1844 for the uh, Royal Navy and then two years later for the U.S. Navy became port. It was only port instead of larboard. So just to avoid any confusion whatsoever. Um, and so that... Come on, guys. Left yeah. and right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's get some updates done. That is yeah. the left side of the boat. That is the right side of the yeah. boat. And just let's universally know that we're not talking about my left or right. We're talking about the boat's yeah. left or right. Yeah. <laughs> and so that this makes it... The Navy, 101. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so, but what kind of an interesting... Just a lot of sailors shout to each other, wait, my right or your right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one interesting thing about this, to make it even more confusing, is up until the 1930s, uh, when, when something switched, when you would say hard to starboard or something like that, you would actually mean turn the ship to port. Oh, because you're putting the, the, the thing to starboard. The, exactly. The rudder. Exactly. And so you would, you're talking about the rudders way. And so the ship would go the opposite way. And so this around the 1930s up until then, that was, yeah, that just makes it so much more confusing Yes, um, to give, but, and this is why, this is why if you'll see some of the depictions of Titanic, uh, where they'll say hard to starboard and then you'll see the boat turns to port. And that was, uh, was, he was actually doing exactly, the first officer was doing exactly what he was supposed to do. It just seems like it's backwards uh, to us. Because it's like, well, they said hard to starboard. Why didn't he? Why didn't he turn to starboard? But he actually did. You know. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Hard to starboard. Yeah. And the boat turn. There you go. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, feedback discussion. The that's it. We're done with our with with our sailing pirate themes. I liked it. Yeah. I like these pirate ones. So apparently, N- Nera K uh, says that. The way we were pronouncing that goat is actually should be like devil, but you know, with a yeah, so yevil or yevil, one oh. or the other. So, the, the, this was the goat that people tried to. Is this goat still, still it alive? Is. I'm Did looking at it right now. I've had this live webcam up on it for like a long time up on one of my monitors, <laughs> same yeah. my little workstation. So, and it's, still, it's still there. It's now daylight in, in there, but um, it's still standing. It's covered in snow As of at the Christmas moment. Eve. Yeah. I know it made it to Christmas Eve, so I mean this is mm. this is prime time. People like to get it before Christmas, so leaving this up, we'll see. It's the last day, yeah. Maybe you wake up because it's late where you are. Maybe you yeah. wake up tomorrow. 
Yeah. And, the, guard, yeah. and, and the devil goat is no more. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you if you have no idea what we're talking about, this this go back and listen to our episode about the devil, the gar gar. What was Yev- it again? Yeah, Yev- 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 or I think. Yev- cool. There's a goat. It's in Norway, Sweden, 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 and people try to burn it down every year. It's a giant wooden goat. It's a great story. It's it's pretty hilarious. Yeah, it is. Any other follow up? Yes. Uh... You want to read this one? <laughs> oh, yeah, I got it. Uh, American Ot- uh, Otaku? How do you, I don't know what that is. Sure. Uh, yup. David, you're right about those goddamn Canadian <laughs> drivers. Those of us in Bellingham, Washington, suffer under the oppression of the cheesehead road rage. What's a cheesehead? Is that like a slang for Canadian? <laughs> I assume is that to do with those cheese, like, uh, what are they called? But it starts with a P. They're Canada's famous for it. Uh... Poutine? That's the only yes. Thing. I think <laughs> Is so. it really? I think so. I didn't even know that was cheese. Um, yep. And uh. fries is a dish originating in Canada, Quebec actually, but fries and cheese curds. So I assume that's what they're referring to. But yes, that is where I lived. That is where I lived and, and witnessed that very thing, how you could see, you could spot the Canadian drivers from, li- you don't need to see their license, but you can see them from miles away. The road rage. <laughs> <laughs> and the way they drive and it's so it's such in contrast because they're all so nice in person <laughs> yeah canadians famous but they're such fun. aggressive drivers and like you know, <laughs> get really angry at every little thing but yes that is where i lived where i also witnessed that so it, they maybe it's just the vancouverans uh canadians maybe it's not like a wide a widespread oh, canadian well, thing um, a good friend of mine is from who lives in prague is from vancouver mm-hmm. and i've never seen him drive though <laughs> so <laughs> yeah uh we'll have to see maybe i'll like say hey man let's go for a drive you drive my car and we can yeah. see like yeah. how he drives yeah yeah um shall i do that final one i see there's one other item oh, that, follow was, up. that one's just for us apparently there's a typo in episodes well yeah i i realized um i thought yeah i fixed this like two weeks ago this must be some <laughs> super old follow-up and then i'm like i look on the website mm, apparently i forgot to click the save button <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah, there was so, just a misspelling on episodes yeah so Val, valdaria on the forum uh, mentioned that helpfully um, among yeah. other things oh uh, and apparently uh, also swedish happy holidays and fantastic new year from sweden um, we got an international listener base yeah yeah, yeah we, <laughs> had, go we had burn several, down that goat. several <laughs> swedish uh, people yeah go for it down the goat <laughs> <laughs> i want to see it and preferably when i'm awake and like working or something so i can launch we'll get like a summons from the swedish like courts <laughs> you boys were encouraging people to burn down the goat that is a crime <laughs> just to be clear don't we're not encouraging anyone to burn down the goat however amazing that might be yeah and just fun to watch yeah do you want to look at some reviews sure or uh, it depends how hideous is my audio i realize we subjected people to nearly an hour of uh, what this you for once, sound amazing but... for once i'll sound better than you this is going to be great <laughs> <laughs> I got one from Uhe Misson who says these cats are the best and like this it's a long time well, I don't know if anyone's called me a cat before yeah. but I like it yeah. uh, Cassie Buihan says I've always loved random knowledge and this podcast could... all of these are five stars by the way we've been rocking those five star reviews yeah. I always look on our iTunes and it's like the things and I always see there's, there's three one star reviews and then I'm like, when that, when if ever that gets bumped up, I'm like, ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. What's people like, somewhere, somewhere anyway? Uh, but, 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 I'm never disappointed. This is actually one of the few podcasts I've found where I don't zone out while I'm listening to it. Always great energy and never a dull moment. That's good. Taco Lulls says, um, the show for all kinds of people. I myself am a recluse and headphone up every time I leave the house. And it's always a go-to. I don't think I'm a recluse, but I do always also headphone up whenever I leave the house. Yeah. I'm rarely outside without headphones in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'm like, this is an opportunity to learn. I should be listening to an audiobook or a podcast. Or, or sometimes you just put the headphones on, even if you're not listening to anyone, if you just don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> it's 100% true. People will bother you far less yeah. if you're wearing headphones. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I'm just doing those latest three. It's... Uh, uh, I know we're recording a little bit later where you are. I'm we're on different yeah. schedules and stuff right now. But and it is Christmas Eve. Zones, so, as always. You know. It is Christmas Eve. My yeah. family, they're like 
are you working right now? <laughs> like <laughs> nine o'clock on Christmas Eve morning. Yeah. And I'm like, I got to record podcasts. I got to yeah. do what I got to do. Sponsors yeah. need ads. People need content. We have, yeah, we have deadlines. <laughs> In this case, it was mostly sponsors needing ads before a deadline. <laughs> yeah. 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 We already, we already pushed <laughs> off the one sponsor. So yeah. <laughs> don't, don't want to make you too mad. All right, man. Listen, you have a great Christmas. Everyone listening, yeah. wait, this is this doesn't make sense. You have a great Christmas. Everyone listening to this, I hope you had a great Christmas. Yeah. Happy New Year. All mm-hmm. of that jazz. Let's wrap it up. Thank you for listening. I apologize for my audio. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back in the New Year. See you soon. In charge of a small cock. <laughs>